So let me just very briefly introduce Ben. Um, most of you will probably use software that he wrote. So he has been working on the Google Chrome, the V8 team for many, many years. Before that, he worked on embedded software in his uh, PhD, I believe. Uh, he worked at Sun and worked on projects like Maxine. That's a Java virtual machine written in Java. So he did a lot of cool stuff. More recently, he, I think, was involved in the TurboFan project and implemented the first ASM.js backend for that, which uh, then motivated him to start um, his other the WebAssembly standard. And he is working on a pretty cool interpreter for that. And if you haven't seen it yet, there's a Ooksta paper out, a couple of other pretty cool stuff. And uh, much of this work is uh, based on this virtual language that he kind of, I suppose, revived now after many years of uh, being back in academia, his work on that assembly. And I hope he's going to tell us a little bit more about that language. Yes, definitely. Great. Um, then the floor is yours, Ben. Okay, thank you. So uh, yeah, there's lots of uh, M words in the title. So the idea is that I like implementing managed languages. And if you're going to implement a managed language, why not use a managed language? And I think this will ultimately touch on uh, the question of what is assistance language? So the agenda here is I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do have, have done for my day job. But Virgil, which is mostly what this talk is about, is really stuff that I've done on the side. It's been my nights and weekends project, so to speak. I've written a few papers about it. Um, there is a PLDI paper, which no one has cited, which is <laughs> has got a lot of detail about the language. Um, I've learned some lessons about requirements for systems languages by working on that. Uh, I've, and part of that is because I've done it the hard way, so bootstrapping the language from nothing. And I've had to give Virgil some new tricks for implementing this uh, research VM for WebAssembly called Wizard. And I think that I have a new perspective on what it means to be a systems language. So uh, I've been at language implementation for a while. So I did language implementation when I was a graduate student. I worked on OVM, which was a project at Purdue uh, led by Jan Vitek. Um, when I went to UCLA uh, to do my PhD, I started working on Virgil and it was for embedded systems. And then I started working at Sun. Uh, as an intern and worked on various uh, JVMs, including Hotspot. Uh, when I graduated, I went to Sun and worked on Maxine VM for almost three years. And that's another Java and Java virtual machine. And so there's a lot of really cool ideas there that informed my thinking about how A, Virgil should be designed and B, systems and languages in general. I moved to Google. I worked on things that were not language related. And I'm personally mostly interested in language uh, implementation things. So I, uh, you can forget what I did. Uh, and then I started working on V8. So I moved to Munich and uh, started working on the TurboFan JIT compiler and the JavaScript implementation, and that led to uh, starting the WebAssembly project. In 2020, uh, I had this wonderful plan to go, uh, you know, have this uh, exciting adventure in Australia. That turned out to be slightly different than I imagined because of the pandemic, but I did get some research done and did teach a course. So that's when I started working on Wizard, which is this WebAssembly engine. Uh, and then the audio is breaking up, unfortunately. OK, so I'll try to talk a little bit more distinctly okay. and slower. Uh, OK, and then fast forward to now. I'm at Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. And uh, actually, if you could mute your audio, I'm getting some blips from your audio. That might help the quality. OK, I'll continue. So what that means in terms of uh, languages and language implementation is that I spent a lot of time working in various languages, um, doing various things. Uh, in particular, worked a lot with C++. I worked a lot with Java and Java implementations. I worked a bit on JavaScript and also on WASM. And I think the lesson from this is that actually, if you want to learn about this stuff, you should always be implementing things. So in the early days, I was tinkering with kernels and interpreters. That was mostly in C++. Then I moved on to working on JVMs and building them on various ones here. 
and then started working on the JavaScript VM. And then kind of graduated to where I am now, which is working on WebAssembly originally in V8, um, but now in this research engine wizard. So, but the Virgil has been the kind of like my mistress on the side. So I've been nursing ideas there and working on compiler stuff and working on GC stuff on the side for almost 20 years now. And I wrote a couple of papers about it and I haven't talked about it too much in public. And so this is an, uh, an opportunity for me to do that. The first ver version was for embedded systems. I wrote a couple of papers about that. There's still interesting ideas there that you can go back and look at if you're interested. Um, I won't cover all of those things here. Um, but after working on the embedded version, I kind of picked it up in my spare time as a, a way to do language design and also work on compilers that didn't have to do compromises with the languages I was working with. I wrote a paper about it in PLDI 2013 um, that has a lot about the language design. And there's some interesting ideas there and a bit about the implementation, but there's a lot of work that went unpublished. That's mostly just code that I've written on the side. And uh, some of that will be relevant for today. Okay, so now what's a systems language? And I think we have to start with what are languages and what are good languages? And I think this is the first requirement that any language should have. It should have an implementation. So there's lots of theoretical programming languages and type theory stuff. I don't find that particularly interesting unless you can run them. So I think you learn a lot more by implementing a language. So in addendum, what is a good systems language? I think the key modification to that requirement is that it must directly run on the target machine. And so this is really a lesson from implementing many different VMs in Java. So Jike's RVM was a Java and Java virtual machine. It had to bootstrap itself from scratch. So they had to build a Java implementation, including compiler, actually two compilers in Java. Same with OVM. I think OVM used an interpreter written in C and later a C code generator. Maxine two compilers, actually three compilers in the end. Again, implementing Java in Java, bootstrapping the language from scratch. There have been many other projects that have tried to use Java as a systems language, and they all end up having to start over from scratch. And I think the issue is that ultimately, all su successful systems languages that I know of, they already have a supported native implementation. It just makes things so much easier if the language is designed to at least be statically compiled for this use case. So this is a challenge. It's a laborious process. In particular, generating native code is a lot of work. Uh, depending on how many pieces you reuse, you may have to write an assembler. You may have to write a compiler, a runtime system and garbage collector in libraries. But the payoff is that it's liberating and empowering. You can define your own syntax and abstractions, of course, but also you get to choose the implementation for the constructs that makes sense for the system that you're writing. And the other thing is, is that you can do things with the kernel and the CPU that you can't do if you don't have the ability to design and implement a language. And of course, this can be made a bit simpler with some by reusing pieces of existing software, but ultimately you do have to do quite some implementation effort. OK, so the next language requirement, I think this one is if you slice this one finely, it might get controversial, but it's sufficiently bland at a high level that I think I can get away with saying that a language should offer programs, programmers the ability to build abstractions the way they want and to debug their programs in terms of the abstractions they built. And I mean something specific about that last part is that you shouldn't have to debug things like memory corruption. The systems addendum, I think, should actually allow you to do all those things and the only additional requirement is those abstractions need to be efficient. I think that we should keep the ability to debug abstractions at the level of the abstractions that are written and not have to debug them in terms of the machine. So what does that mean in Virgil? So in particular, there's one neat idea that I brought over from the embedded world, the embedded version of Virgil, is that you can do compile time initialization. So in particular, this code here, this initializer here, this method, actually runs at uh, compile time. So there's an interpreter for the entire language. You can run arbitrary amounts of code, and it can generate arbitrary heap data, and that will be compiled into your binary. That was absolutely required for doing embedded systems where they cannot uh, allow you to dynamically allocate memory. Um, but here actually has a nice benefit of that you can build data structures that your program will actually be optimized against. 
The other thing is, is that we inherit from the idea of, for example, Java, that objects should be passed by reference. Objects are not implicitly copied. There's no such thing as passing an object by value. So you don't get like an expensive thing that you can't see um, that might show up in other languages. So there's no implicit copying going on. The other thing is, is that it turns out that writing in a somewhat immutable style is nice. And so Virgil has some syntactic elements that make that nicer. The other thing is, is this is a systems language. We want the cost to be explicit. We want the abstractions to be efficient, but also when we use abstractions to know how much they cost. So there are no allocations on the heap which are implicit in Virgil. They're all explicit. And these are the only four constructs that allocate objects on the heap. Allocating an instance of a class, allocating an array, initializing an algebraic data type, or partially applying a function. So this is creating a closure where some of the arguments are known. So part of that is that I like writing in a semi-functional style. I think it's quite useful. Uh, and so kind of borrowing from the from the uh, lessons of C sharp, Virgil has delegates. They're implement as a fat pointer, which means that it's an object and it's a code pointer. There are two scalar values, which means that you can take a method off of an object and pass it around as a function and call it as a function. And none of those operations allocate on the heap. So this is actually required because in the embedded systems version of Virgil, you could not allocate dynamically on the heap. So you basically are using the object system as the closure system. The other thing is that Virgil has tuples. Tuples are basically just pairs or even triples or n airy tuples of scalar values. These are always flattened by the compiler. They're never allocated on the heap. And so it turns out to be very useful if you just want to return multiple values or pass multiple values or put multiple values into an array to have tuples. And the syntax is like very clear. It's just things in parentheses are tuples. The other thing is, is that it turns out that you want to write generic code and having specialization, meaning the compiler generates different versions of the code, uh, means that you get efficient, uh, for example, array copies and you don't ever have to, for example, auto box uh, primitives into objects to fit them into the generic system. Um, there are other things that are just niceties, like for example, Virgil has enums where they can be defined almost like tables. Um, so there's an enumerated set of values here that represent the days of the week, and they might have different names for different uh, languages. And so you can add additional, what I call fields to enums and basically define these nice tables. Uh, the other thing is, is that if you look at the PLDI 2013 paper, Virgil doesn't have algebraic data types. That was not entirely an oversight. I knew that I might eventually want to have them. And so now it does. And so you can define a new value type that has different cases. They work very much like algebraic data types in, for example, ML. Um, and they're immutable. They have no identity. And there will be deep comparison by the compiler. And they may be allocated on the heap or they may be un unboxed, uh, depending on uh, how much optimization happens. And the last thing is, is that you want to trust the compiler to generate good code. And the compilation model in Virgil is that you always compile the whole program at once. And so it perform all the optimizations. You don't ever have to worry about linking .o files. Um, you just hand all your source files to the compiler and it generates a binary for you. And so it actually will optimize against your heap too. OK, so the question of this systems language, you want to have Virgil, you want to have abstractions in any language that are robust, meaning that you can't break them by having basic bugs in your program. So the core language of Virgil is statically typed. It's memory safe. There are some dynamic checks. For example, array bounds are checked dynamically at runtime, and also explicit casts are checked at runtime. So when you do have a safety violation, it turns out that that happens. People write programs that have bugs. And so Virgil is not in denial that systems are going to be written bug free. So instead, when you crash, you always get a source stack trace. It will give you the function that you're in, its names, the file, and the line number. I consider this to be table stakes for any programming language, and Virgil is no different. So even though it runs directly on the hardware, it commits, even if it's done inlining or any other optimizations, 
you will always get the exact same stack trace when your program crashes, so you can debug it. That also means that Virgil doesn't have undefined behavior, and I mean something specific by that. It's C-like undefined behavior, where a compiler is not obligated to give you any semantics whatsoever if you have a bug. So instead, Virgil is actually obligated to give you those source level stack traces and crash if your program has a bug. That means that you don't have to debug memory corruption. Your program's not going to run out of bounds and silently corrupt its memory and just keep going, and you have to work, work that out later. Um, so you don't have to share, stare at machine code dumps um, unless you're using the unsafe features, which we'll get to. Okay, so let's go back to language requirements in general. So I think a language should allow you to build big software. Scripting languages are nice and all, but I think that in particular, good languages should allow you to build large, complex software systems, and also succinctly. So what's the systems addendum to that? I would say a systems language should actually allow you to implement itself, too. This is an important check on whether it's expressive enough and low level enough to be able to do all the tricks that a language implementation requires. So this is the hard way. Self-hosting a language, it's a wonderful thing. It's a hard thing, particularly if you want to do it to native code. That means that you can't, for example, reuse a compiler written in a different language or a runtime system written in a different language or a garbage collector written in a different language or libraries written in a different language. Maybe you can use a textual assembler. Maybe you have to write that by hand. I did all of these things. I wrote all of these things from the ground up for Virgil. But this is a liberating thing. It's a, and it's empowering thing. So in particular, you know, the world is your oyster. You can use, you can use any instructions that you want. You can define your own calling conventions. You can control the process address space and do tricks that are not typically available if you have to live with code in your process that's written in another language. It also means that you can and pretty much must interact with the kernel and the CPU directly. So you kind of have to know what you're doing is there's a lot of low level stuff that you have to take care of. And I think this is actually an important check because a we are able to uh, bootstrap the language, but also we're able to question our assumptions that have snuck snuck in from the code that we would otherwise write in another language. For example, if you link against libc. So with Virgil and I think a good systems language, you should be able to start completely from scratch. Otherwise, you can end up stucking, being stuck with all of the compromises and the baggage of the languages um, that you use. OK, so there's a bunch of neat tricks in self-hosting Virgil. So the hard constraint is I wanted to have no code written in any other language, including assembly language. And so that means that the compiler does linking. It does all the stuff. So it generates an L file, a Mako file, a jar file, or a WASM file directly. It just outputs the bytes. You don't generate O, .o files and link them. Um, so it doesn't use libc, it doesn't use any C code in the garbage collector, none of that, it's all written in Virgil. So there's a bunch of process address uh, space layout tricks that can be used there. For example, how exceptions are implemented. Exceptions are implemented by jumping to unmapped code. And so you will get a signal and then the, and then the runtime system handles the signal. And that's actually a neat trick because you get in the signal handler, you get the from uh, address where the code is, and then you can use that plus the metadata to generate the stack traces. And so that's all in the runtime system. All that's implemented in Virgil. It needs a little bit of additional help. So it's not completely memory safe to handle signals. For example, the kernel gives you a layout of the U context, which has got all the registers. And you need to stack walk. You need to walk over the actual execution frames. So in actually knowing what those execution frames look like, that requires some metadata and also requires some compiler intrinsics to do unsafe things. For example, uh, to get the caller's instruction pointer so you can actually know where you were called from. So you can go look up in the metadata what the name of that function is. And then also to get the stack pointer so that you can actually start the stack walk. And so the compiler metadata helps uh, the runtime system be able to, to do this in terms of pointers. OK, so now there's not really an analog of this requirement number four for sort of general purpose non-systems languages. So this one is just systems language requirement number four. 
I think a systems language must support interaction with low level software and hardware using their native data formats. We see this because in particular, we need to interact with the kernel to do IO. So the question is, well, you could write assembly code because the kernel allows you to do like either an interrupt 80 or uh, a syscall instruction where you have to put the things in the right registers. I decided I didn't want to write additional assembly language. I think that's the job of the compiler. So in Virgil, you get a platform specific thing called syscall. So on Linux, it's called linux.syscall. It's polymorphic. You So it takes any kind of arguments. This is effectively untyped. But one thing it always takes is a system call number. And since T can be instantiated with any Virgil type, including tuples, and tuples get flattened, that means you can pass multiple arguments to the kernel. The compiler knows the kernel calling convention, so it will put the things in the right registers or on the stack in the right location and then emit uh, the right sequence to go into the kernel. And so you don't have to write the assembly for that. You can write it all in Virgil. And there's no restrictions. I toyed with the idea of first enumerating the system calls and trying to make them typed so that their signatures were known, but you end up in, with a problem that you constantly need to add more of them. So instead, there's this one mechanism, linux.syscall, and you can pass whatever the heck that you want. So you can do memory mapping. You can handle signals. You can set up signal handlers. You can do I.O. You can, and you can do everything else. In particular, you need to pass data to the kernel. It's not just integers. You need to pass like different data structures. And the way that's done in Virgil is uh, you pass a pointer into the middle of byte arrays. So there are two unsafe features. Uh, one of them is pointer at contents. And you can give it an array, a byte array. And then that you actually get a pointer back. And that's a direct pointer, honest to God, address of the thing in memory. The object needs to be pinned so that it doesn't move by the garbage collector. Uh, but that means that you can fill out exactly the data structures that you want to call into the kernel. And it's kind of an excuse me, unsatisfactory solution. You kind of have to lay out, like you have to do pointer arithmetic to lay out your data structure exactly how the kernel wants. So I'm working on a new language construct to make that a little bit easier where you can define the exact memory layout that you want and also to be able to deal with off heap data in the same way that you deal with on heap data and that's the range type. OK, so that leads to the next requirement. I think the system language, this is probably the most controversial one. I know that uh, some people in the Rust community would probably disagree with this, but I'm going to lean into this one. I think that a systems language should must actually support garbage collection. Notice that I say support. It doesn't necessarily have to require garbage collection. I don't think that necessarily that everything that you write has to be garbage collected, but you're ultimately going to write garbage collected systems with the systems language. So it needs to give you some kind of support. And let me be uh, a little bit more explicit with how that works in Virgil. So all the things that are objects and arrays and boxed algebraic data types and Virgil are heap allocated. Virgil is unabashedly garbage collected. That's, I think that's a lot more productive and uh, I would prefer to do it that way as opposed to uh, needing to manually memory manage things. So all the allocations go into a garbage collected heap memory. And how does that actually get garbage collected? We need to write the garbage collector in some language uh, committed to the hard way, which is it's written in Virgil. So there's metadata for the garbage collector. So the stack maps, so where references appear in execution frames, and also where references are in objects. The compiler generates metadata and leaves it in a particular location with a given binary format that the runtime system can parse. So stack walking and scanning, they all start from those intrinsics of where's the stack pointer, where's the instruction pointer, and then do stack walking by basically decoding this metadata, which is in a binary format generated by the compiler. But that means that you can write all the code in Virgil. It's very low level and dangerous and unsafe, and it's a pain to debug no matter how you do it. But ultimately, it boils down to just using pointers. I decided to not do a super fancy collector because there's only so many things that I can debug when I need to move on to do something else. 
So it's the simplest semi-space chaining copying collector you can imagine. And that keeps the compiler honest. The, the uh, garbage collector moves every object every time. And so bugs in the stack map show up quite easily. In the future, of course, Virgil will support more advanced GCs with bright barriers, needs, support object, needs to support object pinning across multiple threads and stuff like that. But for this, is able to get off the ground and be fully self-hosted. OK. I think that this is a actual requirement for systems languages, that you must demonstrate that it is a systems language by the proof is in the pudding. You must build something. You have to implement a real high performance system using the language. So the question is, is the Virgil language implementation itself a real system? I mean, it is kind of self-serving. Uh, sure, writing a compiler, that's some 40, 50,000 lines of code. You can make it really fancy. You can have an SSA optimizer and you can have, it needs to have an interpreter. So it's a pretty big chunk of software. It's got a whole program optimizer. It's got multiple backends. But really a compiler is really something that just loads a file, does something to it and outputs another file. It doesn't really, it's really not a system. You could write that in almost any language. So I don't think that's a proof that, that Virgil is a, an actual systems language. Of course, the runtime, that's harder. We have to do all the things that were required, um, implementing the direct kernel system calls, implementing the garbage collector itself. That's about 3,000 lines of code for all the targets. So the garbage collector is pretty simple. It's only a few hundred lines of code. But like stack walking, exception handling, and other things are add up to about 3,000 lines of code. But actually, most of the code that I wrote is all in random applications and demos and tests. There's lots and lots of tests, but none of them are super. They're not high performance things. They don't do all the hard stuff of systems. They don't do really heavy IO uh, and they don't. For the most part, those applications don't need the unsafe tricks. So the question is, is this established as a systems language? And I would say not quite yet. So what are you going to build to prove that this thing is a system language? And I think since I work on virtual machines all the time, I dream about doing virtual machines. Why not do a virtual machine? And so what are the things that have to go into a virtual machine? You have to do code loading and validation. That's just loading a file and reading it. That's not particularly systemsy. You want to have efficient representation of programs. That's kind of systemy. You have to write a runtime system, which is getting there. Uh, then you maybe want to write an interpreter. So maybe there's some tricks that you want to do that make it fast. That's getting even more systemy. But then now we're talking about systems. When we talk about JIT compilers and garbage collectors, these are the harder things. This is going to require all the tricks. OK, so Wizard is here now. Wizard is this WebAssembly research engine. It's an attempt to look at what next generation runtime systems should look like. I think WASM WebAssembly is going to be a basis for new uh, runtime systems living above, but also how that is implemented. So I think this WebAssembly makes a, a good context for all this work. So Wizard is a research WASM engine. It's written in Virgil. It's designed for flexibility and instrumentation. Um, Stefan men mentioned it before. I wrote a paper this year uh, on the interpreter design. I gave a talk about that a couple weeks ago, so you can get a preview of what I'm going to talk about at Uppsala. And I'm going to give a bit of that here in a minute. So it's spec compliant, so it implements uh, all of the specification as it is and passes all the tests. It also has some extensions. It's supposed to be flexible. So the idea is that, you know, as we're considering adding new features to WebAssembly, you want to go and try them out in a VM. And what better engine than a research engine? In particular, WebAssembly has a garbage collection extension. So it has a low level typed object system that's now making its way through the standards process. So I implemented that in Wizard, and I think that's one of the key experimentation things that I'm looking at. And of course, there are various people um, who know about Jike's RVM, including Richard. Uh, I kind of hope that that Wizard could be like the Jike's RVM of WebAssembly. So it's not a production engine. Um, it might run close to the speed of a production engine, or at least close enough that re that results are transferable. But it's more for doing experimentation in academia writing papers and trying out new things. OK, first problem. So Virgil has this nice mechanism of writing algebraic data types, and we're writing a guest VM. That guest VM has values. 
In particular, WebAssembly has these seven different kinds of values. It has references, which come from the GC extension. Those are basically uh, allocated on a garbage collected heap. It has a kind of a tagged value, so you can have an, a 31-bit integer that is also considered a reference. You can't have tagged values in Virgil, uh, but you can unify them with this ADT concept. And then there's the rest of the primitives. So you've got 32 and 64-bit integers, 32 and 64-bit floats, and it has a vector type, which is 128 bits. So this is nice, right? This is the actual definition in, in the wizard engine. There's no like writing a bunch of unions and methods and constructors and stuff. That's all taken care of by having a nice abstraction called the algebraic data type. And it gives you the semantics that you want. Values are immutable and they have no identity. If you create two I32s, they should always compare equal. But the issue is, if you look at how this is implemented, uh, by default, all these things are going to become objects. So when you create an I32, it will get boxed onto the heap. Of course, the Virgil compiler will generate a deep comparison, so you don't see that it's boxed on the Virgil heap. But the issue is that that's less efficient than, for example, unboxing them and tagging them. In particular, when you write an interpreter, it's going to traffic in these left and right. It does every instruction is popping two ADTs off the stack and then inspecting them and then computing something and then constructing another one. So it's like super high traffic. This is like the hottest part of the interpreter. And the other thing is, is that, yeah, you can make them unboxed, but you also have to do pattern matching. So there's effectively dynamic checks in an interpreter that you would write in this way. And then when you get to representing the program's state, uh, you eventually will have an array of values, and that's going to be bounds checked. So if you write it this way, this is benchmarking the wizard interpreter, which is written in pure Virgil code, so it's completely memory safe. It uses arrays and ADTs against JavaScript core's WebAssembly interpreter. So that's the spider, that's the uh, the Safari uh, WebAssembly engine or JavaScript engine. So there's three different versions of wizard. It's the same code, just compiled to three different targets. So 32-bit x86, 64-bit x86, and JVM. So, so Virgil can run on the JVM, so this is just compiling wizard to the JVM. And it's slow. It's like ridiculous. You spend so much time creating these objects on the heap, it's like, there, there's just, it's just not a system. You cannot run 160 times slower than another interpreter and expect to get any signals whatsoever. So this is like a total fail. Okay. So I was thinking about this. Well, I know how to make this thing faster. We got to change the value representation. We got to fix that ADT boxing problem. There's different ways to do this. You can write, for example, you could write it as a bunch of tuples and tuples are unboxed and flattened and Virgil will be happy to do that. But you got to rewrite the entire interpreter. And so it's all super inconvenient. And when you get there, there are other interpreter overheads still. So there's bounds checks everywhere. You have to make sure that you get all the code inlined exactly how you want. So you've got to teach the Virgil compiler exactly the inlining heuristics that are necessary to get the right code. And also you want to factor out some out of line cases. So you've got to teach it that too. And also it turns out that my register allocator is not the world's best and that needs to be fixed too. So there's like endless amounts of compiler work to even approach what could be really, really good interpreter code. And so I, I decided that, well, yes, I will eventually go down and make my compiler much smarter. I really want to see what the limit here is. I don't want the Virgil compiler to be in the way. And so I decided, well, I'll just rewrite, I'll just rewrite the whole thing in assembly. I'll write the wizard interpreter in assembly because it gives me the ultimate freedom. And I've now I'm faced with this hard problem. I have to dy potentially dynamically generate code and I have to interface the, with, with Virgil. So this is what I came up with. So the value representation that I came up with, values are 32 bytes. That's pretty big. They are tagged. So there's a byte, which is which tells you what the kind of the value is. So whether it's an integer or whether it's a reference. Uh, and then the value stack is actually a custom piece of memory, which has a page of memory on the end of it, which is inaccessible. So that instead of doing a bounds check for every push onto the value stack, which the interpreter does literally every instruction, you'll just get a signal when you hit that inaccessible page. So you got to do the virtual memory tricks to make that fast, to avoid that branch. The other thing is, is that you need to do the same thing for the execution stack. Uh, 
because programs could be you know, unboundedly recursive and you want to handle stack overflow of their execution frames too. So you basically have to implement a, a low level stack overflow signal handler too. So there are other design choices too. I won't get into everything in this picture here, but ultimately what this picture is showing you is that all the state of the interpreter, now that we're writing in assembly, we can map it to the machine registers. So we can put the instruction pointer and we can put, uh, for example, the value stack pointer, all those things can be in registers and we write the, the interpreter exactly how we want it and nothing is in the way. So we can also skip all the bounds checks. So the invariant here is that we don't need to do bounds checks because we verify WASM bytecode. The structure of WASM's type system means that the code can't go out of bounds. You can't jump to random pla places in memory. Uh, same for the side table. It's, this is an extra data structure that helps the interpreter go fast. By design, it can't go out of bounds if the code has been verified. This invariant you cannot express in any programming language at all because it's a property of verifying the meta representation of a program. So these bounds checks are going to be there in the Virgil code, no matter how you do it, unless you turn them off. But in assembly, we just don't have to do that. The other thing is I mentioned the unboxed values uh, and the value stack guard page. That means that we can get by without doing any dynamic checks for uh, overflowing the value stack. OK, so that leads to systems language requirement number seven which is the systems language must interact with dynamically generated code from the program. And I didn't put target code here or machine code. It's some kind of dynamically generated code. Theoretically speaking, if we were working in JavaScript or Java or Python, uh, we could generate new source code and eval it, or we could generate new byte code. So whatever the language of the system is, we could generate code in that. But there's a drawback in that, in that you can only express the things that are in that byte code or source code. Here, we're actually generating target code. So how do we make that work in Virgil? The trick is, well, the ultimate requirement is that you need to be able to call machine code. We can make machine code and put it in memory and we can memory map all we want, but how are we gonna get out of the VM? We have to call it. So mapping the code is actually easy we know how to do that uh, there's system calls so you can call sysm map the virtual compiler will let you call anything in the kernel so that's fine you can map in stuff in your address space but the we need one more thing we need a, a compiler intrinsic which is an unsafe thing forge closure ci runtime forge closure so we give it two things we give it an object and we give it a machine code pointer and it will make a first class function it will make a closure that we can call and we can give it any signature that we want. Uh, we also need the dual because we need to be able to call Virgil code from machine code and the dual of that or the inverse of that is unpacking a closure. So you give it a closure and it gives you out the object pointer and the machine code pointer. And then with the machine code pointer, you can call it from your generated machine code. There's a problem here in that this is very dangerous. It's like incredibly dangerous uh, in particular we have to know some things about how Virgil works. You have to know the calling convention. We could think about maybe generating stubs that adapt between Virgil and whatever calling convention we want. I couldn't come up with a simple way to do that that wasn't ultimately self-defeating. So instead, the requirement is, if you're giving machine code and forging a closure, you need to do Virgil's ABI, which actually isn't too hard because I use the standard system five ABI, it's fine. So the other thing is, is that, yes, now we can generate code, we can call it, it can call us back. But it turns out that actually the generated code needs to kind of hunt around in some of the runtime data structures that we're defining. In particular, that means being able to access some objects on the Virgil heap. So for this, we've got some more unsafe goodness. So in Virgil, there's an unsafe feature on a target platform that has pointers you can point directly at an object. You can convert an object reference into a pointer. You can also get a pointer directly at a field. And then you can, for example, subtract the two and figure out where a field lies in an object. And you can also get pointers directly at the array elements. And the key thing there is that you can basically, excuse me, you can basically 
knowing a little bit about how the object model is implemented, you can generate code that dynamically accesses objects because it knows where the fields are. So that's pretty good. Now we can actually write code that like hunts through the arrays and uh, goes through like the representation of WebAssembly code and functions and byte arrays and stuff like that. Um, but actually we'd like to use some more tricks. So we have these guard pages for the value stack and the execution stack, but also the WebAssembly memory too. That's bounds checked. And so we use the virtual memory trick where we don't actually check every memory access. We use guard pages and what happens? We get a signal. And so we basically need to coordinate with the existing Virgil runtime uh, to be able to get a callback. And so the way this works is that you can register a region of code with the Virgil runtime and signals that happen in that code will first go through the callback. And so you can take control before the runtime system takes control. So this is how I implemented the bounds checking WebAssembly memory. It just uses virtual memory and also the stack overflow checks. Just get a callback from the runtime system. And this didn't require any changes to the compiler. That's all just in the virtual code of the runtime. There's another dirty little secret is that we cheated with the value stack representation. With the values, there are pointers in raw memory that the GC doesn't know about. And they're basically tagged values, which Virgil doesn't have. So there's like pointers to, to GC and host objects that are in raw memory. And Turns out that if we add a callback to the GC when an object is determined live, for example, there's an owner object of the value stack, uh, we can implement a custom scan routine and basically look at the value tags and say, oh, this is a reference. We need to scan a pointer that's right here. The last thing is we need to be tidy with our memory. So we're mapping uh, lots of ranges of memory and they're, that memory is basically owned by GC objects. So Virgil doesn't have finalizers, but actually you can implement that in the in the runtime system with no compiler changes. So there's a callback for when an object dies. You can give it a closure. You can give the runtime system a closure. Um, it doesn't get the object, but it is a closure over other things. And so you can unmap memory when the owned object dies. OK, so with all those tricks, this is the performance results of Wizard. This is in the Upsala paper. So the key idea is that the the y axis, the vertical ax, vertical axis, this is execution time of running some WASM benchmarks, and this is comparing against a bunch of other WebAssembly engines, including engines that have interpreters and compilers. And the key result isn't so much that uh, Wizard is as fast as other interpreters, which is what we wanted to achieve, is that we were trying a new interpreter design, which doesn't actually rewrite the code. So we got into this new region. So this is actually proof that we were able to achieve a research result using Virgil as a systems language, working around Virgil, admittedly, as a systems language. OK, so there's some more challenges coming up too um, that I haven't solved all of them. So when WebAssembly adds its own kind of garbage collected objects, effectively the guest language can create new kinds of objects. If we box all of the WASM GC objects into arrays of values, that will work. But again, it's going to be inefficient. In particular, like WASM GC objects are not dynamically typed, they're statically typed. So we can actually compute new object shapes. You want them to be as efficient as possible. And this requires some extensibility in the garbage collector and runtime system. This is currently only a sketch. I haven't implemented this, um, but Fundamentally, you need to be able to register new object shapes. In particular, if you want to lay out your objects exactly as you want in memory, uh, you have to tell the garbage collector where the reference fields are. And so I think we can do this with a with an API where you can register new shapes with the runtime and you get back a header word. And if you put the right header word, which is effectively opaque to you on your objects, and the GC finds a pointer to your object, and it should be able to inspect your header word and be able to walk over it and find the references. There's some more here, though. If we want to generate high performance code, for example, if we have a JIT, uh, we should be able to know, uh, we should need to know how to allocate ob objects, the allocation sequence. So whether that's a bump pointer or whether that's a free list allocation. Um, if we want to generate code that doesn't leave the sort of 
inlined guest jitted code, then we need to know how that works. Also, if the garbage collector has a write barrier sequence, if we want to inline that, you have to know what it looks like. Um, so there's some kernel knowledge there. Otherwise, you're stuck with a call for every write barrier, and I think that's probably going to be too slow. And the last thing is, is that if we add new object shapes, how do they actually get exposed to Virgil? How do they actually live in the runtime system? And so you can imagine is that if we define a class like WASM object, then these new object shapes are effectively new subclasses at runtime. They, they should all kind of fit under the WASM object type hierarchy. All right, so that leads to requirement number eight. We may need to be able to generate with dynamically generated data types from the program. OK, so this is the summary. So I'm going to wrap up here and give you time uh, for questions, about five minutes. We need to be able to run directly on the target. That's something which is specific to systems languages. That's not specific to a, a regular general purpose language. We need to be able to be build efficient abstractions. I think it's OK for them to be nice. They just need to be efficient. We need to be able to build large systems succinctly. This is a requirement in general for uh, for for any language, but also self hosting. So that also leads to interfacing with low level code, for example, the kernel or hardware. I think the systems language is support garbage collection. If you don't support garbage collection, then you end up having to build a handle system in your runtime system, which makes everything a lot harder and is very buggy. So instead, if you have garbage collection, I think that you can get by making much simpler garbage collected guest languages on top of it. I think a systems language needs to build a real system. A VM is hard because it's got requirements like new garbage collected types and generating machine code from a JIT. And it needs to do things that are really low level hackery to get as fast as possible, including dynamically adding new target code and new object shapes. And I think actually there's another uh, last requirement, which I haven't quite figured out yet, uh, which is something to do with threads. So I haven't solved that one yet, and that is actually a yes, that is my last slide. I'm happy to take questions. Can you hear me? Yes. I'll ask a question. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thanks. I thought that was a really interesting talk. Um, and you've answered some of them. one of my questions. I was going to ask you about threads, but I guess the answer is something, something, something threads. <laughs> um, um, one of the problems that, of interacting with a lot of existing systems is that they're kind of monolithic and it's very hard to do anything different from the assumptions that are baked into them. So mm -hmm. I was wondering with your, I mean, particularly with your ideas for maybe garbage collection, because obviously that's my interest. Um, how flexible do you think your systems are for people to, to implement different kinds of uh, garbage collector? I mean, for instance, once upon a time working with Sun's garbage collectors, you could implement any kind of garbage collector you liked, as long as it looked like a sun generational collector. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yes. This is a tough question. So, uh, you know, I spent almost a year down under talking with Steve Blackburn about this. So I have some ideas here. This is I don't have a good solution yet. As I mentioned, if you want to do the inline write barrier, you kind of have to know exactly what the sequence is. You kind of have to know what the assembly code is going to be. Some ideas to make that extensible are, well, maybe we just enumerate all the interesting write barriers for the, I don't know, 10 garbage collection algorithms that matter, and that they're all some variation of that. And so you can, so the compiler can tell you, I'm using this type of write barrier. That's one idea. It's not super extensible, but there's only so many designs that kind of matter and that you can think of. Another way is that you express those things uh, they're effectively sequences that need to be lowered. So the right barrier sequence is effectively some code that you want to inline. And if you can get that code, uh, 
in some form an intermediate representation, and then you can compile it in. And so what is that intermediate representation? I looked at a bunch of different systems, so I don't know. I remember exactly where Jikes does it these days, but some systems you can get like the compiler IR for the right barrier and you can generate code for it, or you can call a routine that will spit it out for you and just spit out the five instructions or whatever you need. Um, so that's one way to do it. I have a stretch goal that that intermediate representation should just be WebAssembly. You should get the right barrier as a tiny little WebAssembly function. And since it's already a WebAssembly engine with a JIT for WebAssembly, it may be slightly unsafe WebAssembly with some additional intrinsics. You could generate the right barrier by getting its definition from the Virgil compiler as a WASM snippet. Those are all just science fiction at this point, but I want to think about this in the next coming years. I think it would be very difficult to enumerate every kind of barrier. Um, particularly if you want to include read barriers as well. I mean, as an example, uh, I'll give you the read barrier on the forthcoming generational ZGC collector, where um, depending on the phase of the compiler, the address bits in, in, a, in, a, in a word sit in different positions. Mm, interesting. Uh, <laughs> um, which sounds fairly horrible to... Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. We have any questions here? Ben, can you hear us? Yes. Very good. Well, then let me thank you for a very, very interesting talk. You know, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, I, I have a question, but I fear it goes under, under nine. Um, <laughs> Have you sort of thought about what you do about multi cores and how you deal with um, um, shared memory versus uh, keeping information lo local to, to cores? Right. So I think that uh, Virgin needs to natively support threads, uh, in particular, um, since you can do any system call that you want, I can see that a bunch of the threading library can live in the runtime system. So like Linux calling uh, clone or vfork or whatever it is on Linux, but you need some compiler support. So it needs to know about the memory model and it must respect a memory model. Otherwise you can't write concurrent code. So it's not completely a library. Um, there is one thing already for threads. You know, there's a compare and swap operation on pointers. So you can build locks from that. It will generate the machine code for that, which is only a single instruction. But you need to do additional stuff like manage stacks. Um, so that can be done with like, uh, you know, MMAP tricks and stuff like that. So I can see a bunch of that living in the runtime system. Exactly how much stuff is required in the compiler is a TBD. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thanks. So then, if any of the PhD students here now come to us and uh, tell us uh, they want to do the same thing or something similar or better, uh, how long did it take you? How much uh, effort was it in, in real life? I think, so I would give you the following advice. It will be a lot of work. Keep your language simple. It will be less work. Um, don't bother with uh, targets that are not a native target and use. I think I did it the hard way in terms of uh, bootstrapping uh, self hosting. So you don't necessarily need to do that to design all the systems language features. I have spent. Countless years working on this. It is not for the faint of heart. It will more more people on a project might make it faster. But I'm, I'm not so sure about that. All right. What was the motivation for the JVM backend? Uh, so I worked on J JVMs for so long, I thought it would be easy. And it turns out, actually, JVM bytecode, I don't think it was any easier than doing a native backend. It may have been slightly easier to debug, but I have my doubts about that because the JVM really doesn't like you to debug at the bytecode level. Um, and in particular, fitting Virgil's function types into the JVM was a major pain. I spent a ton of time on that. And you don't have to worry about that when you target machine code. So 
that would be the other advice. If you really want to do a systems language, don't target a VM first. It's just it's running in the wrong direction. It doesn't actually save you time in the end. I think we are strictly over the uh, time slot for the seminar, uh, but there is still a question. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, most uh, systems languages I, I can think of support some level of inline assembly code in the, the program language, so you can directly write assembly code. Would you consider that a requirement or, or do you think there's an alternative for that? I don't consider it a requirement. I've done everything possible to make it so that you don't need to do that. So how did you implement the welcome and other Is that separate uh, assembly file? It, it, it is not. I wrote a uh, I, I wrote an assembler and it dynamically generates it into memory. And, and there's actually a good reason for that in, in that since you basically dynamically generate it, um, it's it's effectively the same thing as a JIT. It's new machine code. All right. Any last questions? No. Let's thank the speaker. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you. Um, for anybody interested in programming language implementation stuff, 